Great took the slide off. Thank you. I have Sorry. a quick question <laughs> for the slide that was just on. So there was a dash curve that seemed to be reproducing this uh, data from Remy Ruyer that yeah. uh, at low metallicities, uh, at low metallicities, there seemed to be much lower dust to metal ratio than in high metallicities. Am yeah. I reading this correctly or no? Did I? In, in your models, do you get kind of almost by model distribution at low metallicities, you have very different dust to metal ratio than at higher metallicities? Um, I'm not sure what you exactly point is, but uh, at the low metallicity end, it's the basically the initial uh, supernova production uh, track on the low okay. metallicity end. And then gradually, as you increase metallicity, it kind of kicks up into this uh, saturation level limit. Okay, so on the so low metallicity end, of course, there is a scatter that we don't really fully account for, if that's what you're asking. If that's what I'll, you're asking. I'll find you at the break. Okay, maybe later. Yeah. Thanks. Can you Okay, so let's thank Ken again. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. So the speaker is Brand Robertson, who will talk about constraining galaxy formation cosmology with Lyman Alpha. Okay, okay. I'll give you a five-minute warning, okay? All right, I'll need it. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone, to Santa Cruz. I'm Brant Robertson, if you don't know me. Uh, I'm a professor here at, in astronomy and astrophysics. Today I'm going to be telling you about work that's primarily done by Bruno Villasenor, who is in the back. Bruno wave to everybody so uh, they can talk with you. Bruno's a wonderful uh, student who is defending on Tuesday. Um, and so, you know, wish him luck. And you can give, you, this can be a trial run for Bruno's uh, thesis defense. There's a, a variety of wonderful people working with us. Ryan Hausen, who just moved to Johns Hopkins University. Piero is the main other collaborator in the group. Evan Schneider, my former student, she's a professor at Pitt. Nicole Draco is also in the room. Nick Nedden, uh, Hanje Ju, uh, Ruben Biargia uh, at um, Oak Ridge, uh, some people from AMD, and uh, Hewlett Packard. So there's a variety of these papers that have come out lately. Um, Bruno's paper on, on the second half of the talk will be out any day, we promise. Okay, so um, today's talk is about how we can learn about cosmological structure formation and galaxy formation from the properties of intergalactic gas, and then also a little bit about how we can leverage new computational architectures to better model our universe. So what is Lyman Alpha Forest? Um, so I'm going to be talking about the intergalactic medium, Lyman Alpha Forest, of course, that connects to galaxy formation, as these are the sites, the cradle of galaxy formation. And uh, you know, a lot of the time we're looking uh, inside out, we're looking at winds, but here I'm going to be concentrating more on the environments of galaxies, and eventually we'll be moving it in scale. So you have the intergalactic medium, you have some distant quasar. The light from that distant quasar is filtered through the intergalactic medium, and uh, the neutral hydrogen gas along the line of sight produces absorption lines that are detected in the spectrum of this quasar as a deficit of light along the line of sight. Uh, we care about the transmitted flux um, through this medium, and it's often the statistical properties of this uh, transmitted flux that, uh, that we measure. I'm going to take my mask off here. Hopefully that's a little bit clearer. Now, uh, observationally, one of the <laughs> Really great things that we have coming is DESI. DESI, if you looked at the archive last night, is really up and running. They are uh, about to uh, have results uh, later this year on things like the Lyman Alpha Forest. Just a remarkable facility dedicated use of the Mayall four, uh, four meter telescope with 5,000 robotic positioners. And if you're interested in the Lyman Alpha Forest, they'll have a huge uh, source density of quasars from which they can measure absorption line spectrum over uh, much of the sky. And there will be quasar targets at least to three and a half, if not uh, even higher redshift for which they can measure the forest. And this is really a great era to look at the Lyman Alpha forest. So of course, you know, as you have um, uh, these improved experiments, you need improved simulations. So we need large computational volumes because they're probing a large part of the sky. We need high resolution because often the physics that we care about most uh, impact the small scale structure of the Lyman Alpha forest. We need improved systematics. How can, we, uh, how can we trust the simulations? And this is something we should always be revisiting. We've heard a lot about that today. 
And then also better computational performance. We want to explore a wide range of parameters, cosmological parameters, physical parameters. So you need to run large numbers of simulations in order to do that. And of course, if you can get a code that runs quickly, then that will help you. Uh, and that brings us to Choya. Choya is uh, a GPU native, massively parallel grid-based hydro code. I haven't heard people talk too much about Choya here at the conference, so I just want to be sure that people are aware of it since it is uh, a code that's been around a while. It uh, includes all of the state-of-the-art hydrodynamical algorithms that many of the grid codes that are available in the literature do. And then Bruno, for his thesis, has included gas self-gravity, PM gravity, cosmological evolution. He implemented the particle scheme. He implemented helium and uh, hydrogen helium chemistry and cooling and heating. And that's all on the GPU. So uh, when you've heard me talk about this before in the past, perhaps we, you, know, you heard we were using Grackle, as, uh, as I'll mention uh, in the future. Um, we were spending all of our time doing Grackle uh, in our simulations. So we abandoned Grackle so that we could actually make use of the performance of our code. Uh, and that's not a slight on Grackle. That's really just saying that this is a really fast code when all of the hydro and gravity is faster than the Grackle lookup for heating and cooling. That should give you some idea of how fast the code runs. OK, so uh, it also runs on the world's fastest supercomputers. As you may know, the largest supercomputers in the world nowadays are based on GPUs, and that's primarily a power uh, consumption issue. They're very efficient computers, but also, at least in the United States, a lot of the largest supercomputers are owned by the DOE, and the DOE has codes that run on GPUs, and so they build uh, GPU-based supercomputers. And we can leverage that investment to run our cosmological simulations. And uh, we've benefited from uh, lots of uh, allocations on these supercomputers, including a current Insight Award on Summit. Um, Frontier, which is the successor to, uh, to Summit. Summit used to be the world's fastest supercomputer. Frontier is uh, an exascale supercomputer that is uh, now up and running, although it's not fully available at Oak Ridge National Labs. We have uh, an allocation on that because we, uh, we were selected as one of the first codes to be deployed on that. That computer is AMD and not NVIDIA-based. So many people think of running on GPUs as running on NVIDIA GPUs with CUDA. We actually run uh, equally well on NVIDIA and uh, AMD GPUs. So we have that flexibility. We can run on Frontier, and we're hoping to get more time uh, to do more simulations on Frontier now that it's available. OK, one thing I wanted to mention, because I mentioned it before, uh, and this is not the only comparison I could show, but uh, we've been really careful to try to make sure that Choya uh, is well calibrated and reproduces the results of other codes, and really to try to understand some of the systematic issues with our code. So now we're doing PM gravity. So this is a cosmological simulation uh, with PM gravity comparing uh, against Nix, which is another code available in the literature, and also Ramsey's. Note that we get 0.05% agreement on all scales in the cosmological matter power spectrum compared to Nix. We're, you know, we're using the same particle integrator scheme, not the same code, completely developed independently. And we get the same answer. And we're better than a percent agreement with Ramses, Okay, the public version of Ramses. So that is a good indication, I think, that these codes are doing you know, the same thing largely uh, which is good. So uh, since we're interested in the power spectrum, that's, uh, that's something you might care about. OK, so what are we doing? So uh, we're looking at the Lyman Alpha forest, and we're interested in two things. We're, we're interested in the impacts of galaxy formation on the forest, and we're interested in the impacts of cosmology, like dark matter on the forest, because that's one handle to understand how dark matter changes in dark matter might affect galaxies. That's one place where observationally there are good constraints. So those are the, those are the fo uh, focuses of this kind of work. So we need to understand what the photoionizing background is. Um, the photoionizing background is a combination of the emissivity from galaxies and quasars. OK, this is the, basically the production rate of ionizing photons. But then those photons can only inter, uh, ionize intergalactic gas if they can travel throughout the intergalactic medium. So actually, the mean intensity, which gives you the photoionization rate in this integral, uh, over energy and the cross-section of uh, photoionization cross-section is actually related to the product of the emissivity and the mean free path. And so as part of this work, we were interested in trying to understand the evolution of the UV background. And that actually depends pretty strongly on what you assume for this mean free path. So like Hardin Madau, my good friend Piero, 
he and Francesco Hart, they, um, they made an assumption in their model, if you're not aware, about the evolution in the mean free path to high redshift. They extrapolated from some measurements, uh, some estimates of the mean free path observationally from hydrogen absorbers at fairly low redshift. They just extrapolated this out to high redshift. So it turns out that in that model, the production rate, the mean intensity, the product of the mean free path and the photoionization rate is too high. Okay, so you should not be using hardened Madau as uh, un, you know, unaltered as your ionizing background because the mean free path during reionization should go down substantially and that changes the high redshift mean intensity. So if you run a hardened Madau model, reionization actually in your simulations will happen at like redshift 13 if you don't do anything about it. Um, and Puquine at all kind of realized that, so they came up with a new model for the photoionizing background that accounted for this, and some other people have worked uh, on something similar. Well, we were interested in solving this problem kind of generically. Okay, we wanted to compare the results of cosmological simulations where we varied the photoionizing background produced by galaxies, varied the actual photoionization photoheating rates, okay, but then constrained that with data. Now, how do you do this with cosmological simulations? Because it's very complicated physics. You have to understand what's happening over a wide range of redshifts and densities. You have to understand the temperature structure of the intergalactic medium. Um, well, the best way of doing that, okay, and here, here is the, the Puquine et al. model for the energy per ionization, the hydrogen photoheating rate, the hydrogen photoionization rate. You also need the helium rates in order to do this. Well, um, you know, you can't just pick one model, right? You pick one model, you compare with the observations, the Lyman alpha forest, you don't get the same answer. How do you know how to change that model? Well, you don't, generically. Really, what you should be doing is actually running, sorry, uh, a huge suite of cosmological simulations, hundreds of cosmological simulations. This is difficult to do, unless you have a code that is very performant, like Choya. So for us to do this, we need supercomputers to do this problem. But we can tackle this problem. So we can run hundreds of simulations of the Lyman Alpha Forest where we vary the amplitude of the hydrogen and helium photoionization rates and also their timing. When does helium reionization occur? When does hydrogen reionization occur? We can vary those on a grid and then do Monte Carlo interpolation uh, to, to compute like a Bayesian likelihood of these model parameters, the, the amplitude and timing of hydrogen helium reionization compared with the Lyman alpha forest. Okay, so that's what we're doing. We're showing you all of the models, kind of the full range of helium and hydrogen uh, photoionization and photoheating, helium-2 as well. And you can see, it's not clear here, there are many orders of magnitude on this plot. There's quite a wide range of flexibility in this model. Okay, this is a very flexible model. And it, uh, you know, it covers basically all of the interesting range of, uh, of, of this variation in photoionization and photoheating. All right, so then what we do is we run these cosmological simulations and we compare with the Lyman Alpha Forest data. Okay, now to give you some idea of what happens in these models, so this is changing the amplitude of helium photoionization and photoheating. This is changing the timing of helium reionization. Okay, this is at redshift 3.6. And this is the temperature of the Lyman Alpha Forest. So what we've done is we've run a bunch of simulations. This is just 40, I think, where we've tiled them according to the parameter that we use. We ran a full cosmological simulation for every point, you know, basically in this entire plot. And you can see, that, you know, as you increase the heating of, of, of helium photoheating, or you have later helium reionization, which pushes it closer to redshift 3.6, you get a hotter IGM. And if you have a later uh, helium reionization relative to what Puquine et al. used, and you have less uh, helium heating, then you get a colder IGM. This makes sense physically. That's basically what's happening, okay? Uh, and this is what one of the simulations looks like. So we're running uh, 1024 cube cosmological simulations. We can run higher resolution than that, but we're running a giant grid. So what we do is we try to calibrate to make sure what are the resolution effects uh, comparing, you know, 1024 cube to higher resolution simulations, we understand that we account for those errors on this grid. Uh, this is a 2048 cubed cosmological simulation, but it gives you an idea of the rich structure. You know, this is to remind you that for every point that I'm going to, uh, to talk about in these Monte Carlo grids, 
there's a full cosmological simulation that we analyze in order to understand how close those parameters are uh, to the real universe. Okay. So what do we do? We run a cosmological simulation. We produce uh, model spectra of the Lyman Alpha forest. Okay, so we have some idea of what the optical depth at every location in the simulations are. That gives us what the transmitted flux is, and then we can take the power spectrum of the transmitted flux to compare with the observations. That's what we do. So we uh, produce thousands of model spectra for each one of our hundreds of cosmological simulations in this part of the talk. And then we compare the Lyman alpha horsepower spectra against the observations. This gives you some idea. So this is the dimensionless power spectrum of the Lyman alpha forest transmitted flux at redshift three and a redshift four. And here I'm just varying each one of these physical effects. I vary the amplitude of photoionization. You can see as we decrease the amount of hydrogen photoionization, the spectrum goes up, okay? Because there's less transmitted flux. All right, we have helium photoionization, and then we, um, uh, you can see here, this is the redshift. So this is the timing of hydrogen and helium uh, photoionization, or uh, 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 redshift reionization. Okay, so, that, so that's just looking in each direction independently. What do the actual cosmological simulations look like when we do a Monte Carlo uh, Markov chain to try to fit this grid of high dimensional grid of simulations to the data going from redshift 2.2 all the reg way to redshift of five. And here we're comparing with uh, EBOS, which is the precursor to DESI. And, uh, and so those are, uh, that's a large scale uh, cosmo cosmological survey. But then there are higher resolution observations using Keck of the higher redshift alignment alpha forest. We include those two. Those are important for comparing against say, warm dark matter, which I'm getting to in just a moment. Uh, and then we show you for comparison, oh, and there's also um, similar measurements by Beware et al. from uh, 2019, uh, kind of in this redshift range. And we show for comparison the Volter et al. Uh, measurements came out in 2018. Okay, so we compute a marginal Lyman alpha forest power spectrum for every combination of our parameters. And we uh, then compute the likelihood based on the data. So what is the likelihood of the data given the model? This is what the, oh, there's one other piece of information that's important, and that is the mean helium optical depth. We don't have a Lyman alpha forest measurement for helium. So what we need to do is compare with the helium optical depth. And this is important for constraining the lower redshift part of the photoionization photoheating uh, in the universe. All right, because helium photoionization photoheating, once you ionize all of the hydrogen, basically your photoionization balance in most of the volume of the intergalactic medium, the heating rate is relatively low until you get a lot of helium reionization uh, close to redshift of three. Okay, so helium reionization dominates at low redshift, hydrogen primarily at higher redshifts. So we have to try to reproduce this, and you can see we can reproduce well uh, the observational constraints. All right, so this is something that you don't see very often. This is a corner plot where we've <laughs> simulated everywhere on this grid, full cosmological simulations. This is something I think people have wanted to do for a long time, okay? These are full, not just in body, obviously, these are full hydrodynamical simulations that include, uh, you know, heating and cooling and chemistry uh, of hydrogen and helium. And then we compute relative to the parameters. Uh, so these, these parameters, what they are, they're relative to Pouquine. So Pouquine would be, one, beta equals one for hydrogen, beta equals uh, one for helium amplitude, and then the delta H and delta, uh, delta ZH, delta ZHE would be zero if it were Pouquine. So you can see that we actually think, given the forest, that the amplitudes of hydrogen helium photoheating should be lower than the Pouquine et al. model, although the timing of hydrogen helium reionization is pretty close in those models. So we prefer a slightly earlier hydrogen reionization and a slightly uh, earlier helium reionization than what's in Pouquine at all. Okay, but you know we've come up now. We've done what we've wanted to do for a long time. We've used you know something like the Lyman alpha force to actually constrain observationally the parameters of something that's a fairly complex piece of physics in the simulations, the photoionization and photoheating background. And so then you can just go to Bruno's paper and actually look up what these rates are. And here we're showing a comparison. Red is the Pouquine et al. model, 
and the gray uh, curves are the constraints that we derive from the Lyman alpha force. So if you want a high accuracy photoionization and photoheating model that reproduces the Lyman alpha forest, and you want to use that in your simulations, so if you're looking at things like uh, low ionization species of oxygen in the outskirts of ga galaxies where it matters what the photoionization, photoheating rates are, uh, you can use something that is consistent with the Lyman alpha forest as uh, your first order uh, approximation. Okay. Let me keep going. So um, what does the history of the temperature structure of the forest looks like? Well, here uh, I'm showing, I'm going to show simulations where we evolve the temperature of the forest forward in time. So uh, early, at early times, the forest is quite cold. But as hydrogen reionization completes, your photoheating photo, uh, your photoheating hydrogen as your photoionizing hydrogen. Once uh, hydrogen reionization completes, then there's not really a strong heating source anymore, and the galaxies, or sorry, the intergalactic medium continues to cool as the universe expands. That is until quasar heating starts to become uh, important, where you're actually ionizing helium again. So you get photoheating of helium that then heats, reheats the intergalactic medium. There's then a second peak of the temperature of the intergalactic medium at full helium reionization, and then there's adiabatic cooling to the present day. So this is what the temperature history of the intergalactic medium is. And you can compare that with observational inferences of the, of the intergalactic medium temperature. And you can see here, this is the slope of the power law connection between density and temperature in the intergalactic medium. This is very uncertain. Uh, you can see what our simulations predict by fitting to the Lyman alpha forest. These measurements are not fit to. These are just inferences from the observations. I have five minutes. I'll have to go faster. All right, so uh, long story short, we're consistent with the temperature history of the Lyman alpha force other people have inferred. OK, so now another thing you can do is look at warm dark matter uh, in the Lyman alpha force, because that changes the, uh, the matter power spectrum. And this is something that Bruno is about to submit a paper on. So um, you know, we want to model the dark matter as something that is relatively light. So there's a free streaming scale that will suppress structure in the Lyman alpha forest, and we can try to compare with observations to constrain that. The smoothing, though, is degenerate with all of those heating effects that I told you about previously. You heat the forest, you smooth it out. You have warm dark matter, you, you smooth the forest. So you have to account for those simultaneously, and that actually requires a huge number of simulations. So here I'm showing what uh, the evolution of dark matter structures, uh, no, sorry, this is gas structure, isn't it? Uh, in the Lyman alpha forest as a function of time around galaxies. So going to low redshift, and this is using CDM and then progressively lighter warm dark matter. You can see that free streaming. So what we do is we actually run more than 1,000 full cosmological simulations varying the warm dark matter mass, the amplitude of photoionization, the photoheating per photoionization rate, because heating affects the small scale forest that's degenerate with um, warm dark matter, and then also the timing of hydrogen reionization. OK, so this is going to be submitted soon. Now, I'll skip this. We know that free streaming suppresses the linear matter power spectrum, but what does it do to the Lyman alpha forest? Well, actually, what it does is it, it changes the amount of gas at intermediate densities in addition to small scale structure. So actually, in warm dark matter models, there is more intermediate density gas in the intergalactic medium than in CDM. And what this does, which may surprise you, is it actually boosts on large scales the power spectrum. Now, many people will renormalize this out because I don't know why, but, uh, but we don't. OK, so this is a prediction of those models because there's a higher opacity in the intergalactic medium because there's more intermediate density gas. But then also on small scales, it suppresses the matter power spectrum. And I'll skip this slide. OK, so this is what the main result is. So here are the best fit CDM and warm dark matter models to the Lyman alpha forest at intermediate redshifts, where it's the most sensitive currently to that measurement. OK, and you can see here, if you look closely, you'll see that the chi-squared is actually better for warm dark matter than for CDM. And if you look at the corner plot, this is what the corner plot looks like, you can see that in our warm dark matter mass, this is one over the warm dark matter mass, which is a common way of doing it. This is CDM. This is very light warm dark matter. You can see that our best fit is actually not CDM. It's something that has a KV of something like four or so. 
what did I say, four and a half, but it's consistent with CDM. So this is, I would say, interesting. I would not say that this is conclusive. We do know why this happens. It has to do with the small scale shape of the matter power spectrum, and warm dark matter does seem to fit that better. Okay, there are a few caveats that I wanna mention uh, about this, but this is uh, intriguing. Uh, let me skip ahead. Skip ahead, all right. If you just look at the CDM only case, you might say, well, maybe you get crazy parameters for the Lyman alpha forest heating uh, in your warm dark matter models. Actually, they're very similar to the CDM only case. Okay, so the nuisance parameters of the Lyman alpha forest heating are basically the same in CDM warm dark matter. So that is not the solution. So it, it, you're actually getting pretty consistent answers for what the thermal structure of the IGM is. It's somewhat colder in the warm dark matter case. Okay, and that makes sense because you balance smoothing versus heating. And so if it's colder, you can smooth more with warm dark matter and get the same overall power spectrum as you do in CDM with a somewhat warmer um, intergalactic medium. Now, if you account for inhomogeneous reionization, that reduces the tension. So there are methods for post-processing your power spectra to account for the fact that we, we, we assume a uniform background, okay? So if we did full radiative transfer in all of these simulations, we could account for this, we don't, all right? So we have to post-process, and you can see that that actually reduces this preference for warm dark matter, okay? And that's because these fixes to account for inhomogeneous reionization actually suppress the small scale power spectrum somewhat. Okay, it reduces but not, does not completely eliminate this tension. So this is, I would say, interesting and something that needs to be investigated further. So you might say, so what are the next steps? And since I'm wrapping up here, so what are we doing now? Well, uh, we're using machine learning models to try to include galaxy formation. So we don't have any winds that could affect the small scale structure of the forest, but we don't resolve galaxies in these simulations that are PM grid simulations, okay? We could do higher resolution simulations, which I'll tell you about in just one second. So instead, what we're doing is we're using uh, a certain machine learning model to include the effects of galaxy formation in these simulations by predicting what the baryonic structure in resolved simulations are from the dark matter halo properties. This works surprisingly well, like percent level accuracy in some cases, compared with uh, croc simulations, we can actually predict what the stellar mass and star formation rate of, of galaxies are just based on their dark matter halo properties in the simulations. And this is uh, work by Ryan Hausen. And then of course, you can go to higher resolution simulations. So one of the great things about Choi is we can actually run enormous cosmological simulations instead of running thousands of small ones and 1024 cubes is you know, a moderate size simulation nowadays. Uh, we can run really large simulations. So to give you some idea, in the time that I've been talking, we could run 125 2048 cubed cosmological simulations to redshift of two on Frontier, just in the time I've been talking. That's how quick Choi is. It takes about 760 seconds to run a 2048 cubed cosmological simulation to redshift of four, which is amazing. Okay. So, um, you know, hopefully you've given, given some idea of, you know, why this is interesting. This, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to do more comparisons in the future. Um, you know, it's, it's intriguing, I think, that we see some preference for warm dark matter. Uh, I think we all don't really believe that as, uh, as the solution to the problem. So we're trying to understand exactly what additional observations would allow us to rule that out. We still see a uh, very good consistency with cold dark matter. And we have a very good constraint on what the history of photonization and photoheating in the intergalactic medium is, which you're all welcome to use uh, when modeling galaxy formation. So thank you for your time. Thank you very much. I'll take your questions. Thank you. Thank you. We have the time for a few questions. Oh, there's lots of stuff here. Uh, can't say how impressed I am. Uh, <laughs> well, it's Bruno and Evan who've really done most of the work. Bruno's yeah. the, yeah. Um, so, uh, I don't work on simulations, but I'm very interested and very curious about it. Just wanted to ask, what is the black magic behind this feed? What are you doing? <laughs> yeah, so, um, so a lot of it has to do with the parallelization on the GPU. So we tile the, uh, the cells onto the GPU. The CPU almost does no work. It really just sits there for us. Right now, it used to be that we'd keep things resident in CPU memory and we'd kind of 
we wouldn't fully offload. We were always running on this, the GPU, but we would do like MPI communication from the CPU. We would do cooling from the CPU. But now in the new structure of these supercomputers, the GPU is actually resident on the same card that the, uh, the network card is. Okay, they're integrated. So you, don't, you never want to go to the CPU. The CPU is really just taking up space <laughs> for us in these simulations. It, it, it provides a little bit of extra memory for us that we're trying to leverage to help with some load balancing issues. But really, it's keeping things on the GPUs, which can do certain calculations very quickly. And one of those calculations is grid hydrodynamics. It does very well. Um, we also have accelerated the Fourier transform. So with Trey White at Hewlett Packard, we now have a block-based FFT uh, solver that works entirely on GPUs. It does not touch the CPU. And that is extremely fast for a Fourier Poisson solver. OK, so we have a very nice FFT solver uh, as well now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for the nice talk. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Probably I missed some points, I guess. Uh, the first one is uh, I didn't quite understand whether you were fixing the cosmology here. Yeah. So, uh, are you varying the cosmology in particular, for instance, neutrino mass, sigma eight, these kind of things? Yeah. So, so first yeah. So in Bruno's first paper, we did look at how you vary cosmology. We can't do all of those at the same time. So. Just varying the warm dark matter mass and the amplitude of the heating and uh, the timing of realization, we have a thousand simulations. Every direction you go in, you uh, dramatically increase the number of simulations. So we, we can do like six or seven ish parameter uh, sets, okay, and dimensionality. Um, and we've thought about doing cosmological simulate, uh, like just co cosmological parameters. We've looked at variations. It, you know, it doesn't impact necessarily the photoionization, photoheating calculations. There are things with the warm dark matter that you might wonder about, like the amplitude of the power spectrum, for instance, could uh, could influence that. Um, and this is something we've uh, we've looked into a little bit. Yeah. And the second part of my question, very quickly, was about resolution. So yeah. is it, does it depend on resolution, especially in the underdense part? Uh, and <coughs> also, does it depend on uh, like feedbacks, for instance? Yeah, so, uh, so feedback in the high redshift universe, probably not a huge impact uh, on these results. Okay, And it is the case that for most of these Lyman Alpha 4 simulations, people do not include the effects of feedback for most of them. OK, I'm sorry. AGN feedback. Uh, well, I think for those, the volume of the universe at redshift of five that's impacted by AGN feedback actually doesn't contribute very much to the Lyman Alpha Forest. That, that is my sense of it, yes. Your other question was about resolution. And like I said, we, we do resolution studies, and we adjust our uncertainties when we do our fitting appropriately to account for the fact that there is, there is a small scale effect on the resolution. We have done, I will tell you, I think higher resolution simulations, Lyman Alpha Forest, uh, than anyone else. These, most of these are not those. But we've done resolution studies where we've investigated this in a lot of detail, including you know, different uh, like CIC versus TSC ways of calculating the, uh, the gravitational forces, doing the interpolation, those kinds of issues. We've looked at a lot of this. Other questions? So the questions? next speaker can maybe set up, and we can take a very quick last question. Uh, <laughs> uh, OK. Uh, could you? Say a little more, the, the low Z uh, helium uh, background parameters, it looked like were pretty big differences. Uh, with Pukwine. With Pukwine. Can factor you say what's two. driving those? Yeah, factor of two, that's okay. right. Uh, it was yeah, hard please. to tell it was one of your lots of orders of magnitude. Yes, that's right. It's lots of the orders of magnitude. But it's